Hi, thanks for tuning in to Ancient Greece Declassified. Episode 1 Tomb Raiders, Code Breakers, and the Discovery of Antiquity. Anyone today with an internet connection has at their fingertips an incredible amount of information and detail about what was happening in Greece and Egypt and the Middle East 4,000 years ago. You can even read the personal correspondence between the pharaohs of Egypt and other Bronze Age rulers, and tons of other stuff written in long dead languages and scripts, like Akkadian, Sumerian, Hittite, Ugaritic, Egyptian hieroglyphs, and Mycenaean Linear B. But how is it that we can read all these funny scripts and dead languages, some of which we didn't know existed a century ago? 200 years ago, no one had ever heard of the Sumerians or the Minoans or the Hittites. They probably wouldn't have believed you if you told them that such civilizations had existed so long ago. So how did we get from there to today when every time archaeologists unearth a new tablet with writing on it, there seems to be an expert at hand, ready to translate it in time for the National Geographic headline. Well, the 19th and early 20th centuries saw a succession of amazing discoveries about the ancient world. If there was ever a time when archaeologists resembled Indiana Jones, that was it. They may not have carried whips, but these adventurers often broke their bones while digging for ancient stones. The knowledge they uncovered filled many tomes. Antiquities were taken from their ancient homes and used to adorn western domes. Anyway, this episode is going to cover four of these incredible stories. So stick around and you'll hear about the Rosetta Stone and why it's been called the most famous rock in the world. You'll also hear about the businessman who went digging for a mythical city and the architect who cracked the code of the Linear B tablets. We'll get a glimpse of the laborious and often dangerous work that went into a lot of the discoveries which formed the basis of our knowledge of the ancient world. Our story today is going to start just over 200 years ago, when something big was happening in Europe. The French Revolution had recently sent shockwaves around the world, and now there was one man's name on everyone's lips. Napoleon had arrived on the scene. And in the year of 1799, Napoleon was in Egypt. Wait, what? That's right, in order to open up French commerce with India and to weaken British control of the trade routes, Napoleon had led a force of 40,000 men and had occupied the land of the Nile. And there was something about this invasion that was different from other invasions, and that is that Napoleon took with him a whole scientific expedition. Over 160 engineers, mathematicians, historians, chemists, all kinds of different scholars. These were not just any scholars, these were the top thinkers of the day. For example, the famous mathematician Fourier, where we get the Fourier series, was one of many other big names that came along. Napoleon, in doing this, was probably emulating another famous invader of Egypt, Alexander the Great. Alexander had with him a retinue of scholars and engineers on all his campaigns, and like Alexander, Napoleon was trying to craft an image of himself as a civilizing conqueror, and not a sack-and-plunder type of conqueror. So in Egypt, these members of the French scientific expedition went all over the place making maps, copying down ancient inscriptions, making detailed sketches of all the impressive stuff they saw, and collecting enough statues and other antiquities to fill a museum. But the one thing Napoleon's army found that caused the most excitement was not actually found by the scientists, but by a common soldier. It happened when the British had caught up with Napoleon in Egypt, and the French were quickly building a defensive fort at a place called Rashid, aka Rosetta. A soldier noticed that one of the stones being gathered for the building had writing on it. That in itself would not have stopped the French from using it. There are more stones with ancient writing on them scattered around Egypt than in any other country in the world, and unfortunately, people have been reusing these easily available ancient stones to build new stuff for thousands of years. But this soldier, whose name has unfortunately been lost to history, saw something about this particular stone that made him pause and go fetch the engineering officer, who came and looked at it and immediately realized that this was something very special. 
Unlike the thousands of other stones with writing on them that the army had encountered so far all over the place, and which nobody knew how to read, this Rosetta Stone, as it became known, was divided into three different sections, and each part was written on in a different script. Two of them were in different forms of Egyptian writing, which again, no one could read. One was in hieroglyphics, and the other was in demotic, which is kind of like a shorthand cursive form of hieroglyphics. So one is the priestly, beautiful, artistic script, and the other is the more bureaucratic script. Knowledge of how to read both of these writing systems had been lost for one and a half thousand years. But this inscription had a third section in ancient Greek, and Greek could be read, by many of the French officers in fact. So the engineering officer looked at it and thought, what if all three sections said the same thing in different languages? This could provide the key to finally reading all the miles of inscriptions adorning the ancient temples and royal tombs of the land. This discovery created a lot of excitement throughout the army, and many officers would come to look at the stone out of curiosity. Soon after, when the French were defeated by the British in Alexandria, the Brits kindly offered to defray the cost of shipping and handling of all those antiquities the French had collected to Europe. After all, the French didn't have any ships, they had just surrendered them. It was an offer they couldn't refuse, and so the British Museum acquired a pretty nice Egyptian exhibit. Legend has it that the French general tried to keep at least the Rosetta Stone by hiding it under his tent, but the word had already gotten out and the British demanded it. Luckily for the French, they had made copies and casts of almost everything, so their scientific material at least was intact and made its way to France, and there they made an impressive 18-volume work called The Description of Egypt, which was eagerly acquired by all the major universities in Europe, sparking a kind of Egyptomania across the continent. And as soon as copies of the Rosetta Stone started to circulate around Europe, there was a lot of excitement about that too, and it sparked a race to decipher the lost scripts. At first, it looked like a British scholar named Thomas Young was going to be the first to crack the code, which would be like adding insult to injury for the French, who had lost the war by this point, Napoleon was exiled, and the British had acquired the actual Rosetta Stone. So this guy, Thomas Young, and by the way, for any science buffs out there, this is the famous physicist Thomas Young, who demonstrated that light is a wave. What Young had realized was that in all the places where in the Greek text there was a royal name, and that was Ptolemy, the Greek king of Egypt, in the equivalent spots in the Egyptian hieroglyphic text, the symbols were circled. They're surrounded by a figure called a cartouche. So based on the hypothesis, which later proved correct, that the circled symbols were royal names, and in this case the name was Ptolemy, or in Greek Ptolemaios, Young was able to get a few sound values for a few symbols, and he made some important inferences about how this script actually works to express words and sounds. Now that still won't let you suddenly read the whole language, but it was a big breakthrough, and it seemed like only a matter of time before the Brits would achieve their triple crown, winning the war, getting the stone, and deciphering it too. And this was very much a matter of national pride for both sides. And still is, in fact. However, in France, a young man named Jean-Francois Champollion had been working on the decipherment for some time on his own, somewhat secretively. He had already come to a few similar conclusions as Young had, when he received a probably over-sensationalized report about Young's breakthrough. Needless to say, Champollion was shocked and devastated by the news, all his hard work and for nothing. Soon after, however, he received more accurate information, that while some sounds for different symbols had been plausibly decoded, the language itself was still unreadable. Champollion took heart again and doubled his efforts, working day and night relentlessly on his goal, and, well, he did achieve his goal, and was the first to actually read the full Egyptian text, and he did get the credit and the honor and the glory for it. If you go today to his hometown of Fijac in southern France, you'll see a monument to his honor in the form of an enormous Rosetta Stone replica filling a large courtyard. So the British may have kept the original, but the French did get their comeback. But why did Champollion succeed where others didn't? In other words, of all the very smart people across Europe who were racing to decode the script, why was Champollion the first? Was it inspiration? Or perspiration? Or did luck play a role? 
Actually, to his credit, Champollion did something that no one else in this race did, and that is he took the trouble to learn a language called Coptic, which was the language of the Christians of Egypt. After the Muslim Arab conquest back in the 7th century, part of the population of Egypt had remained Christian and kept their own language, which descends from ancient Egyptian. In fact, Egypt is still about 10% Coptic Christian, but they mainly speak Arabic now. Anyway, Champollion was the only one in this race who realized the essential value of this one surviving and known Egyptian language, and he put in the long hours of learning it. And ultimately, that is probably one of the main things that set him apart from the rest. And so he truly does deserve the fame that he has. The decipherment of ancient Egyptian opened up a whole world of new texts that could be read for the first time in over one and a half millennia. And of the various decipherment stories of ancient texts, this is by far the most famous. But it didn't fundamentally change our view of history. People already knew that Egypt was super ancient, they already knew about most of the dynasties of the pharaohs of Egypt from Greek sources, so we already had at least a very bare outline. But this amazing accomplishment of Champollion allowed us to add flesh and blood to the bare bones that were there. And the thing about Egypt is that it's the most continuous of all ancient civilizations. Pretty much anywhere else, you get occasional dark ages where there's no written records, and then periods of high culture, and then chaos again, but in Egypt, you can find a continuous supply of monuments, temples, tombs with writing on them, stretching back to 3000 BC, with pretty much no major interruption. That allows Egyptologists to construct a continuous timeline from 3000 BC to the beginning of the Common Era. You can't do that for any other ancient civilization. And so, to this day, our chronology of the ancient world in general, before the classical period, is largely based on Egyptian records. Wherever we discover a new ancient city, for example, and we want to see exactly when things are happening there, one of the ways to do that is to see if there's any contact with Egypt, any Egyptian artifacts there, or mentions of the city in Egyptian sources. And then using the Egyptian timeline, which we do know more or less, we use that to date other civilizations. Many of these other equally old civilizations started to be unearthed around the time of Champollion by these Indiana Jones type archaeologists. In fact, even before Napoleon's Egyptian adventure, in 1761, the Danish crown sent a research expedition to the east. Kind of like the team that would later follow Napoleon, except without the imperial army and smaller. Just a team of six scholars. It was called the Royal Danish Arabia Expedition, and these magnificent six were somehow supposed to make the perilous journey to India and back. Long story short, only one person from this team survived the mission. His name was Karsten Niebuhr, a German. On his trip back, alone, he passed through Persepolis in Iran, which was once the capital of the mighty Persian Empire. There and in other places, he copied down these ancient inscriptions he found on rock faces, written in various kinds of cuneiform script. Basically, this script is made up of hundreds of tiny wedges or triangles imprinted or carved into clay or stone. Reports of such inscriptions had been brought to Europe by various travelers across the centuries, but no one could make any sense of them, and a lot of people even thought that these were just decorative markings, not even a real language. Niebuhr, the sole survivor of the expedition, made the first accurate copies of some of these inscriptions. And that was an incredibly difficult task. I mean, just imagine, you have these hundreds of little triangles pointing in different directions, and you're supposed to copy this down in a way that preserves the original structure, which you don't even understand? Very difficult. Niebuhr worked so hard on this, he permanently damaged his eyesight in the process. But he got back alive, and it was his book about his travels that Napoleon supposedly had in his hand when he gathered the scientists for his own expedition and told them to get ready. Napoleon had kept his expedition to Egypt a secret until the last minute to prevent the British from preventing him from setting sail. So Napoleon basically gathered all these top scientists, holding Niebuhr's book in his hand, and told them, guess what, we're going to Egypt, be ready to leave tomorrow. Another person to be inspired by Niebuhr's book was a German high school teacher of Greek and Latin named Georg Grotefend. 
a contemporary of Champollion, and this is the second of today's stories, which explains how cuneiform was first deciphered. One day, this Grotefend chap is at a bar with a friend, and the conversation somehow turns to the funny script in Niebuhr's book. After perhaps one too many drinks, Grotefend says something like, how hard could it really be to read this stuff? Oh yeah, the other says, then why don't you do it? Well, maybe I will, he replies. Twenty bucks says you won't. Challenge accepted. Now, of course, they didn't actually bet in dollars, but this guy did go home that night determined and woke up the next morning with a mission on his mind and probably a hangover. And he actually went on to make the first major breakthrough in reading cuneiform. He's like the Thomas Young of cuneiform, making the first major step on the way to decipherment. Now, it would take too long to go through Grotefend's entire thought process, but basically he looked at a Persian inscription in cuneiform and he made an ingenious guess that the beginning of the text would be something like King so-and-so, King of Kings, son of King whoever, King of Kings, conquered all these peoples and built all these temples and was just so awesome in every possible way. So if that's the formula, then there should be a cluster of these wedges or triangle shapes in the beginning that is repeated several times, and that should be the word for king. And sure enough, there was a repeated cluster. And between those repeated sections, he thought there should be the name of the king who commissioned the inscription, and the name of his father. So Grotefend marked these two sections that he thought were royal names, and found that they were both of similar length. Then he turned to the ancient Greek historians, who provide the only surviving history of ancient Persia, and he found that there was only one pair of consecutive kings, father and son, who had similar length names. These were Darius and Xerxes. This is the Darius that fought the Athenians at Marathon, by the way, and this is the Xerxes who fought the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae. Anyway, Grotefend's identification turned out to be correct, and he used these names to derive the sound values for several of these symbols. Then, many other people took that as a starting point and went a lot further, deciphering, over the next century, most of the other languages that used the cuneiform script. Akkadian, Sumerian, Elamite, for example. Perhaps the most famous of these later discoveries was the Epic of Gilgamesh, discovered in the 1850s, also written in cuneiform. This work, often called the oldest major work of literature, takes us back to the 3rd millennium BC and contains the story of a great flood, similar to that of Noah, but predating the Bible thousands of years. And so, by the 1860s, the scope of our knowledge of ancient history had expanded far beyond Egypt to include many other civilizations that also went back that far, into the 2nd and 3rd millennia BC. While knowledge of Greek had proved essential to several of these decipherment efforts, the chronology of Greece itself had been unaffected by any of these new discoveries. Now that the antiquity of Egypt and Babylon and the Near East had been pushed back to the 3rd millennium BC, ancient Greece didn't look that ancient anymore. It started to look very much like the new kid on the block compared to its much older neighbors across the sea. Greek civilization, it was thought, emerged as late as the 8th century BC, not even a full millennium, its first fruit being the epics of Homer, namely the Odyssey and the Iliad. Dig deeper in the ground, past the 8th or 9th century BC layers, and you stop finding temples and big cities and impressive art. Everything gets smaller, sparser, and more primitive looking. And so people thought, that's it. That's where the archaeology of Greece ends, because that's when everything began. No one thought that if you kept digging more and more back through the centuries, through the Dark Age layers, that you might eventually uncover an older, lost world of advanced civilizations that had vanished. That seemed preposterous. Sure, Homer talks about a long-gone mythical world of magnificent walled citadels and powerful kings, but that's just stories, right? Well, someone didn't think it was just myth. And this is the guy that archaeologists love to hate. But whatever you think of Heinrich Schliemann, you can't deny that his life story is almost unbelievable. And this is the third of today's four stories. It starts with a young boy fascinated by the tales of Homer, who dreams of one day finding the lost city of Troy, where all his favorite heroes had once challenged each other outside the mighty walls of a lofty citadel. 
Now, imagine how people would react today if a child who really loved Harry Potter were to announce one day, when I grow up, I'm gonna find Hogwarts. That's probably the reaction that little Heinrich got when he said he wanted to find Troy. Silly boy, they would have said, it's only a fable. You see, Homer lived at a time when the various roaming clans and tribes of Hellas had only just started to settle down in permanent settlements. But the world that Homer describes in his epics is full of palaces and citadels and huge stone walls around them. But there were no such palaces and citadels when Homer lived. So this world of his epics was thought to have never existed. It was all made up. But this boy didn't care much for what the grown-ups and scholars had to say. To him, the story felt too real to just be made up, and one day he thought he would go and find it. But in the meantime, he was very poor. He was living in a small town in Germany working long hours in a grocery store. So he decided he needed to get rich first. And fast. And he did. Ten years later, when he's in his mid to late twenties, we find him in St. Petersburg, in Russia, already very rich. In fact, director of the Imperial State Bank of St. Petersburg. A few years later, he would stop by the White House in Washington, D.C. to have a chat with the American president before heading to California to join the gold rush. That was President Millard Fillmore, by the way. And when California that year, in 1950, became the 31st state of the U.S., he automatically acquired United States citizenship. After making his fortune on several continents and becoming an international tycoon, he finally went to dig for Troy, and, spoiler alert, he found it, or found something. But hold on, you're probably wondering, how did he do it? The getting rich part, that is. Well, we can't know exactly, but a couple of things can be said about that. First, he was ready to throw himself into any adventure that presented a new opportunity for him. So, he escaped from his insignificant little town in Germany by hopping on a ship headed for Venezuela ready to try his hand at any trade he could in the new world. But due to a storm at sea, he ends up in Amsterdam, works odd jobs here and there for a while, and learns Dutch. And that's the second thing. He had an incredible knack for learning new languages quickly. And he realized that this was going to be his ticket. Being able to speak any language would be the fastest way to climb the ladder of success. And supposedly, he could learn a new language in under two months by constantly speaking aloud to himself and making up dialogues in the new language. He apparently even found some poor guy that he paid to sit for hours and just listen to him make up speeches and talk to himself in strange languages. Supposedly, that helped him, having someone around to listen to him. And also, it really irritated his neighbors, who were not fans of his foreign declamations. And the third thing was that he was a very diligent worker, which should be obvious by now. So after mastering various European languages, he became a very valuable asset to the company he was working for in Amsterdam. And because he spoke Russian better than anyone else in the firm, they sent him to be their agent in St. Petersburg. So after that, and after he went to America to look for gold and made a huge amount of money all over the place, he finally decided that he wasn't poor anymore and could now shift gears and focus completely on his passion, Troy. So he finally learned Greek, modern and ancient, which he had avoided studying all these years because he didn't want to get sucked into his passion prematurely before making his fortune. And he supposedly learned ancient Greek just as quickly as he had the other languages. Six weeks was his average, he claimed, for learning a new language. And soon he was walking around the hills of northwestern Anatolia, basically Turkey, with a copy of the Iliad in his hands trying to find a place that fit the description of Troy in the text. He found a spot that he thought had to be it, and he hired a bunch of people and started digging. The year was 1871, and Schliemann was now 49 years old. So they dug, and in no time, they found an ancient city. And then they kept digging and found another, older, ancient city under that one. And then an even older city under that one. In the end, nine different cities were discovered, each one built on top of the remains of the previous one. And on the very last day of excavations, they found gold a huge stash of treasure. 
News of this discovery, which Schliemann of course called the treasure of Priam, spread around the world and caused a sensation. But Schliemann wasn't done yet. He went to Greece to find the palaces of the Greek heroes of the Iliad, and he found those too. He started digging at Mycenae, mythical home of Agamemnon, and again, the experts said, dude, slow down, we know this site, it's not that old. But he dug and dug and found an equally ancient Bronze Age layer there, with tombs also full of treasure, even more opulent than what had been found at Troy. This find, which he dubbed the treasure of Agamemnon, sent fresh shockwaves of excitement around the world. And finally, he went to a third place called Tiryns, legendary home of Hercules, and he found an impressive Bronze Age castle there as well, with some of the most massive walls of any site in Greece. So Schliemann accomplished his dream and became an international celebrity in the process. However, archaeologists today believe that the treasure he found at Troy could not have been from the time of the Trojan War, if there was such a war, because it dates from at least 500 years earlier. And what he called the treasure of Agamemnon is also thought to be from a similarly early date, way before the time that Agamemnon would have lived if he did live. Schliemann's excavation methods have also been heavily criticized by archaeologists for being destructive, some might say even brutal digging way too fast and destroying stuff in the process. But others defend Schliemann on the grounds that he was the only one willing to do the job. You know, the mainstream archaeologists basically said, what are you doing? You're crazy. Also, archaeology barely even existed at that point as a methodical, careful discipline. So although Schliemann was wrong about a lot of stuff, some say that he pretty much opened up Bronze Age archaeology in Greece. Against all the naysayers, he proved that there had been a lost world of mighty palaces and kingdoms in Greece before the Dark Ages, almost a thousand years before Greek civilization was thought to have started. For the next hundred years after Schliemann's discovery of Troy, while more and more Bronze Age palaces continued to be discovered and excavated in Greece, no one actually considered this civilization that had come to light to be Greek in any sense apart from geography. Schliemann, of course, did think that these were the palaces where kings like Odysseus and Menelaus and Nestor spoke Greek and ruled over Greek-speaking people, but this was not generally accepted by the scholarly community. Their position was basically, yes, there was a Bronze Age civilization in this area, just as there was in Egypt and the Near East, but apart from geography, there was nothing Greek about it. The remains of this lost civilization looked very different from later Greek material culture, and tablets found there had writing on them that didn't look anything like the familiar Greek alphabet. So these Mycenaeans, as they called them, after the city Mycenae that Schliemann excavated, must have been a pre-Greek people, perhaps speaking a Semitic or Etruscan language, and the Greeks came later, around 1100 BC, either destroying the Mycenaeans and their palaces, or finding them already destroyed. Either way, during the ensuing Dark Ages, they must have then made up their own myths about these older kingdoms as if they were part of their own history, and these myths were eventually woven together by Homer. And so scholars often spoke of a supposed Dorian invasion, according to which these Dorian Greeks came from the north down into Greece, conquered the indigenous people, and brought the Greek language with them. No archaeological evidence was ever found for such an invasion or for any large-scale migration into Greece from the north. But the view persisted, and up until the 1950s, scholarly books on ancient Greece still spoke of an invasion which brought the Greek language into Greece. But the 1950s saw one of the last sensational decipherment stories of an ancient script, which would overturn this view. And this is the final story of today's episode. The unlikely protagonist of this one is an English architect who ended up deciphering the script that had been unearthed at many of the Mycenaean palaces in Greece. This script, found on clay tablets at the various sites, was labeled by archaeologists Linear B. That was to distinguish it from another similar script also found at these sites that was called Linear A, but that's even older and still has not been deciphered. So one day, our young protagonist, still a schoolboy, visits an exhibition in London where an archaeologist named Arthur Evans, who had excavated in Crete, was showing these Linear B tablets. Young Michael, that's his name by the way, Michael Ventris, 
was very impressed by this writing and even more intrigued that the tablets had never yet been deciphered. He actually went on to study architecture, but he never forgot these tablets and kept researching them for years on the side. Now, Ventris was neither an archaeologist nor a classicist, so what gave him the ability to tackle such a puzzle? Well, first of all, Ventris grew up multilingual. His mother was Polish, and he grew up in Switzerland. So as a young boy, he already knew English from his father, Polish from his mother, and German and French from Swiss schools. This early exposure to many languages seems to have made him, like Schliemann, really good at picking up languages. Perhaps more importantly though, he was very open about sharing his knowledge with people and was always happy to collaborate, seemingly never afraid that others would steal his ideas. He was kind of the opposite of Champollion in that respect. So in 1950, still in his 20s, Ventris looked up all the researchers scattered around the world who were working on Linear B, and he wrote to them, effectively setting up a cooperative correspondence. He basically said, hey guys, we're all working towards the same goal, let's share our information and insights and figure this thing out. He sent them all a questionnaire, asking them about different features of Linear B and what they thought was going on, and then wrote up the answers he got in a publication that he circulated among all of them. And one of the main, let's say, bullet points that emerged as a common assumption in the group was that this script was definitely not Greek. Ventris and the others still relied on the predominant academic opinion that this is pre-Dorian invasion stuff. Various candidates for the script were an old form of Etruscan or a Semitic language. Interestingly, if there is a Thomas Young to this decipherment story, someone who made the first major step, it's a classicist who was at Brooklyn College in New York named Alice Kober, and she is finally starting to get the recognition that she deserves for her role in the decipherment. You can read more about her in the recent book called The Riddle of the Labyrinth by Marguerite Fox. Kober actually is one of the only scholars that declined to answer Ventress's questionnaire. She called it, quote, a complete waste of time. And she had a very different hypothesis about what language this is than most of the others. She had noticed that there were various words in the tablets that kept reappearing but with a different final symbol. It looked like the same word could have different endings. This ability for words to have many different endings is a common feature of Indo-European languages like Greek or Latin or German or even Old English, Modern English has kind of evolved away from that system, weirdly. But most European languages have this property of being inflected, or having one word have many possible endings. And this doesn't happen as much in the other language candidates for Linear B, Semitic or Etruscan. So she thought the language was likely an Indo-European language, and she collected a few of these words that seemed to reappear with different endings. Unfortunately, Alice Kober died at the age of 43, soon after Ventris wrote to her. But it was her work more than anyone else's that helped Ventris make the final leap. He studied the words with variable endings that Kober had collected, and he noticed that each one only appeared in tablets from a particular ancient site, a different site for each word. So he conjectured that these might be place names of the different sites. That would explain why they appear frequently on tablets from one place and not from others. It would take a while to go through the many mental steps he made in what followed. So for example, he looked at a later script from Cyprus which had some similar symbols and whose sound values were known, and he tried to see if those might work. He made a bunch of guesses about the sound values of different symbols and tried different combinations of these guesses until he hit upon one combination which, when applied to the words that Kober had collected, actually produced familiar Greek place names. One was Konoso, which looked a lot like Knossos, the mythical home of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth. Another was Aminiso, which looked like Amnisos, and another was Paito, which looked kind of like Phaistos. All familiar Greek place names on the island of Crete. Ventris was thrilled with his breakthrough and now had several symbols he thought were deciphered, and every time he was able to figure out a new word, that would give him another symbol or two. He announced his findings to the world on a BBC radio broadcast in 1952, proudly comparing himself to Champollion and claiming that this is in fact an early Greek script. 
Soon after, the Cambridge scholar of Greek, John Chadwick, who had heard the broadcast, teamed up with him, and together they completed the bulk of the decipherment. The language they brought to light was remarkably close to the language that Homer used centuries later, when he sang of the once mighty kings that ruled from splendid palaces, the same palaces where these tablets had been discovered. But to Vendris's slight disappointment, none of the tablets that were found contained any literature, just palace records and inventory, and some names of gods and people. Ventress and Chadwick were not without detractors, though. For at least a decade after Ventress's BBC broadcast, skeptics, including professional scholars of Greek, wrote articles and books debunking supposedly the decipherment, and in some cases even accusing Ventress of being a fraud. But as more and more tablets were discovered, each one seemingly confirming the decipherment, it became accepted in all academic circles eventually. But Ventress himself never lived to see that. He died in a tragic car accident at the age of 34. In this respect, he shared a similar tragic fate with Champollion, who died after a trip to Egypt weakened his health at the age of 41. Ventress's was one of the last such decipherments that made headlines, so to speak. There are still today some undeciphered ancient scripts waiting to be cracked. For example, there's the Linear A script mentioned earlier, which was found in Greece, and is centuries older than the Linear B script. And there's also the script of the mysterious Indus Valley civilization in modern-day Pakistan, which is even older. Deciphering any one of these would be absolutely groundbreaking. The problem with both of these scripts is that there isn't that much to work with. There are fewer tablets than we have for the scripts that were deciphered. And also, if you've noticed in the decipherment stories of today's episode, and the same holds true for every other decipherment of an ancient script so far, it always has to start with something you know, like a name that you know, or you have to at least guess the language family right so you know what you're looking for. No one knows what kind of language might be expressed by Linear A or the Indus Valley script. And up until now, no one has deciphered any script where we don't even know what kind of language to expect and have no way of comparing it to any language we know. And some people think that there simply are too few tablets of Linear A or the Indus Valley script for a decipherment to be possible. Others have suggested that computers may be the key, and that with computer technology, we may be able to decipher even a completely unknown body of texts. There already are people using computers to study the Indus Valley script, and they have made some exciting findings. If anyone listening knows about similar research into Linear A, please share in the comments section on the website. Moving back to Linear B though, the findings and research have continued since Chadwick and Ventress, and more and more information keeps coming out about the Mycenaeans and their neighbors. In fact, just last year, a Linear B scholar named Dimitri Nakasis received a MacArthur Fellowship, sometimes referred to informally as a Genius Grant, to promote further study of the Linear B tablets, so we can hopefully look forward to more revelations to come about this civilization. So there you have it, four stories of four main archaeological breakthroughs that helped lay the foundation of our modern understanding of the ancient Mediterranean. Interestingly, some of these major breakthroughs were made by amateurs, people who were neither scholars nor classicists. And that's another reason to declassify the classics, because when normal people get interested and involved, they often have important contributions to make. In archaeology, there are still potentially entire new worlds to be uncovered. Some of you may have been wondering, if digging deeper and deeper in the Greek soil eventually unearthed a lost civilization that no one thought was there, could the same happen elsewhere? What about Sicily or southern Italy, for example? Were there no important Bronze Age cities there? None have been found yet, but the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. If any of you have heard of the Sea Peoples, some scholars are starting to think that they may have come from places in the Western Mediterranean that haven't yet been discovered. If you haven't heard of the Sea Peoples, you can learn about them in the next episode, where we're going to talk about what brought the Mycenaean world down. In fact, the reason we have so many clay tablets with Linear B is that most Mycenaean palaces were destroyed by fire in the 12th century BC and the fire baked these soft clay tablets, thus hardening them and preserving them for us to find thousands of years later. 
Now, why all these palaces seem to have been torched around the same time is a mystery that we will try to solve in the next episode, entitled Bronze Age Apocalypse, 1177 BC, with preeminent Bronze Age archaeologist Eric Klein. Thanks for listening to Ancient Greece Declassified. Sing Orpheus, then sing something that's going to last. A thousand years slips by so fast, goes up into a dusty myth with you.